All right. Um, so today uh, we are doing the second part of uh, scenario-based ventilator rubber shooting. I hope this time you have a uh, lot of questions to ask from me because uh, today I'm going to be discussing few scenarios and giving more time for to answer your questions. Whatever the questions you have, uh, uh, don't be ashamed to ask uh, questions because uh, ventilation is a totally different uh, subject. For example, uh, even if you have been doing anesthesia and ICU care for a long time, but um, because this was not uh, properly uh, taught in many, many parts of the world, I mean, it, it's a difficult subject. It's not like, you know, I can teach someone about uh, complex uh, stuff about uh, ventilation or so, sorry, um, uh, pneumonia or something because everybody um, everybody um, knows what lung is, you know, all of the um, common anatomical parts, but ventilation, when it comes to ventilation, it's, it's like a black box for most people because uh, they don't know what is happening inside the ventilator. And uh, most of the time we, we collect certain information, we look at the protocols which are laid out by people who have got a lot of experience, but somebody who hasn't got any, I mean, enough experience just by following protocol, it's difficult to understand unless you know the basic uh, principles of managing a patient on ventilator. So uh, it's, it's uh, quite normal to have uh, questions uh, and um, it's a good opportunity for you. So you can ask any question. Don't don't think that it's a very simple one. Uh, you don't get ashamed. You can ask any question, even the simplest ones. Okay, I hope you understood uh, most of the stuff I told last time. So if you have any question from those also, you can ask. So this time um, I'm gonna start with some uh, practical one. This may not be very important in your exam purposes, but I think this is quite important uh, when it comes to practical purposes, uh, practical uh, use of uh, ventilators. So this was a patient uh, who I managed in one hospital um, who had severe pancreatitis with multi-organ failure. And um, uh, and he she had to stay in the ICU for a long period because of the multi-organ failure. And she had quite difficult uh, weaning. <clears throat> Uh, and then, uh, so because of the difficult waiting, I extubated her onto a BiPAP and she clinically improved quite well, but she had a quite a, because of her respiratory acidosis, saturation was hanging around lower side, sometimes drops to 90, 92, but she had no symptoms at all. So she was perfectly fine. So when I sent her to the ward, um, I asked my medical officer, uh, I see the doctor to write down that not to give oxygen. Um, if the saturation is 90 and above and uh, has got no symptoms, the asymptomatic uh, low saturation like 90 should not to give, uh, I mean, she should be okay because that's what she usually is and it might improve with time. But for the moment, uh, she does not need oxygen if the saturation is 90 and above with um, no symptoms. But for some reason, uh, when she went to the ward, uh, uh, there was a medical referral because they were worried about the low saturation and they had advised to start some CPAP. Uh, and then patient, uh, after starting the CPAP, patient gradually deteriorated day by day. And um, when I was going to the theater, uh, I was approached by one of the uh, medical officers and then uh, said the, the consultant asked, me to get some, I mean, ask her to go get some help from me, whether to differentiate whether the patient is having some Pickwickian syndrome, which is a pair of some breathing problem with the obese patients, but she was not that obese. Um, and they actually sent me a blood gas. And I told them, I can't treat a blood gas. I have to know what the patient looks like. So I went to the ward to see the patient because it was one of my patients. I managed the patient and she was okay when I sent the patient to the ward. So I went to the patient. Patient was very drowsy, dysnic, but quite drowsy, kind of unarousable. And she was on a domestic CPAP uh, device with a single limb circuit. You must have seen, uh, we have a lot of uh, CPAP devices with a single limb circuit. And she was on a CPAP mask of 14, 
um, with uh, straps quite uh, tightly uh, held to the um, face mask because she tries to uh, take the mask out. So they have been uh, advising her not to uh, pull the mask out. They have been tightening the pressure so that uh, you can apply the CP. But when I saw, saw this one, so so the device was a domestic type CPAP. Most of the uh, um, smaller BiPAP devices we have in the uh, our country, the smaller ones especially, uh, they have been uh, coming into the hospital because we don't have the, we didn't have um, big uh, dedicated C, uh, NIV devices. We have been using the domestic devices which were designed, yes, quite capable devices, but they were basically designed for um, sleep apnea patients, so um, obstructive sleep apnea patients, uh, so that they can sleep at night. So they usually use a single limb because if you have two limbs, it's quite cumbersome to turn around. So if you have a single limb with a uh, nicely moving swivel, so it's it's easy for the patient to sleep with a single limb. And they usually have a, some way of exhaling through the um, uh, system. But uh, in hospitals, we have different, different masks and uh, some masks are not designed for single limb uh, thing. So anyway, so when I look at the blood gas, you can see the the pH is uh, 7.44 um, and then PCO2 is 72, quite high for this patient. She didn't have that high carbon dioxide and the PO2 was low. She was struggling to breathe. Um, and uh, lactate was normal. She's not particularly septic or anything. The hemoglobin and everything was normal. Base success was high, positive. So this is basically, if you look at the mask, so this is the mask she was wearing. Uh, I'm going to just uh, erase the... Uh, so this is the mask she was wearing. So this mask, anybody has any suggestions? about the mask. Anyone? What does this mask? So if you see one of these masks, this NIV mask, they all look similar. But um, have you seen some, some of the masks? They have, uh, see this shoulder is white. Some of them are blue. Uh, so generally, the color has got something to do with uh, the type of the mask, not always. Usually, the blue one is designed for ICU kind of advanced dual limb circuits. It's not for the single limb. So I'll show you why. For this limb, if, if you look at the mask, there is no way to exhale. So when you get a single limb circuit, the patient is getting gases continuously into the patient's face. There has to be some way of exhalation. So this mask is particularly used for ICU. There is no exhalation port on, to, on the mask. You can't see any hole. So the patient can exhale. In the limb also, you can't see any hole where the patient can exhale. So once you connect a single limb circuit, the patient has got no way of exhalation. So this patient has been struggling to breathe out. But these um, doctors, because they did not know that this mask cannot be used as a single limb circuit. because They all look like um, same mask. So this patient has been struggling to breathe and we have been applying more force so that patient has been exo getting exhausted and becoming drowsy because of carbon dioxide accumulation. This is uh, hydrogenically. We, we have placed the mask so that patient cannot breathe out. So that is one of the, so this is very common uh, in certain, uh, um, I have seen a couple of times, uh, this thing is happening and the patient has been struggling. And then uh, because, because we have been using this NIV more frequently in places where people haven't put enough training. So this is one of the basic mistake people do, selecting a wrong mask with a single limb circuit. So, so I just advise the mask to a vented type mask. This is called non-vented mask because that has got no way of exhalation. So that basically that is what we use in the ICU because we have dual limb circuits we use the normal ICU ventilator and it has got an exhalation uh, filter and a valve so that patient can exhale through the valve. But this particular uh, ventilator was a single limb one. It just pushed gas into the patient's mask. There's no way of exhalation. We have to have a separate 
specific mask with some vents for the exhalation. So the diagnosis was iatrogenic respiratory failure due to incorrect NIV mask. So the patient actually improved within 24 hours, mask removed, and she went home. I think the next day or the, the following day. So this is the patient. So I asked her permission to uh, show her face uh, uh, for teaching purpose. She was happy. Uh, so she she thanked me a lot because she, she was struggling to breathe. And she improved quite quick, quickly once I changed the mask. So all, all what we needed was to change the mask. And actually, she didn't need NIV. Um, uh, so that was one one uh, mistake. So these things are not very uncommon in uh, places where the NIVs, you know, they are starting to use because of lack of uh, awareness about the mask. So I thought of explaining you a little bit about mask, not the, you know, the brands and, you know, what is best and things like that. So I'm just telling you that you can, you can get nasal CPAP mask, especially uh, this is why you have a, a single limb circuit uh, because the patient can, you know, man, so when they are sleeping and you have a dual limb circuit, like a heavy bulky dual limb circuit, it's difficult for them to turn around. So this uh, mask has got a you know a rotatable swivel so that patient can turn this way that way during the sleep without uh, you know disconnecting or without uh, dislodging the mask from their nose. So and then you have the uh, face mask, you have a full face covering mask, and you sometimes have things things which were very um, became popular once again in Italy during the COVID period, helmet devices, but. I'm not going to talk about those things, but I'm going to talk about uh, the usual ones we have. So, so any any uh, NIV, because I told you um, in the beginning of the previous lecture, because uh, ventilator, usually you get a completely closed one in invasive ventilation. Non-invasive one is slightly better because it has got options for the patient to breathe out. And the mask... You can actually breathe, I mean, leak some air through the mask and try to exhale like the patient tried to do. But um, it's not going to be uh, effective if you have a good mask, uh, has got a good seal. It's not going to be easy to exhale to, uh, through the mask. Uh, but usually, I don't know whether you can see, um, there are few uh, holes in the mask over here. So these holes will allow the patient to exhale. It's not that easy compared to a normal exhalation, but still patient will be able to exhale some amount of gases. I mean, you get some leaks anyway from the patient's uh, face mask uh, interface, but you get additional holes so that you can exhale, not normally, but at least with some difficulty, you can exhale. So this, this mask, when you have vents, it's called vented mask. So the holes you can have on the mask, or maybe over the shoulder of the mask, or maybe in the tubing. So when you have a corrugated tubing, even in the tubing, you can have a hole for exhalation. So if the tube does not have a hole for exhalation, then you must have a holes, some kind of holes in the mask when you apply a single limb circuit. It's quite important. But if you have a dual limb circuit, then you should not have any holes in the mask because the ventilator in the dual lip circuit, you can actually uh, look at the exhale tidal volume because the all the masks are completely closed. So whatever the gas patient is exhaling, it's going through the exhalation limb, through the exhalation valve, so that the ventilator can get an idea about the exhale tidal volume. So that is very important. As I told you last time, NIV, one of the most important thing is to look at the exhalation waveform. So exhalation waveform is very good you know, nicely formed exhalation waveform. That means the patient is having a good mask uh, fit. It's not leaking a lot. So it's good. So if you have a vented mask, like a, this kind of mask with the ICU ventilator, with the dual limb circuit, then you're not going to get good uh, waveform. And patient may be getting some kind of ventilation, but it's, it's not the ideal. So you have to select the mask and make sure I mean, to decide how the patient is going to exhale. When you NIV, it's always try to you know make sure where the exhalation options are. So you can have exhalation port somewhere over here, or you can have an exhalation port in the tubing, or some holes, some kind of vents uh, in the mask. So these are some of the masks. So you can see there are holes in this 
first mask so the patient can exhale through that one. So you might be wondering, so how can, why don't you have a big hole? So when you have a bigger hole, you cannot generate enough pressure for the ventilator to, you know, deliver pressure to the patient. So you have to have smaller holes and then the ventilator will still need to, you know, compensate for the leaks from that holes. But the ventilator knows how much is leaking when you give certain flow because it knows about the mask. So basically you use the recommended mask for this particular ventilator. This is not, not necessarily, you know, you can do use somebody else's one also, but still they have good uh, leak compensation capability. But still ventilator has got some idea about it. So the ventilator can still provide good ventilation. But if you have a very tiny holes, then patient cannot exhale. So they come to a compromise situation where the patient can exhale fairly okay. At the same time, you generate certain pressure. So it's not like breathing out. If you can't make the patient 100% comfortable, uh, just because you have these holes. But anyway, these holes are there for the patient to exhale. They are called vented masks because the air is vented, or oxygen is vented, whatever the inspiratory gases are vented through these holes. So they are called vented masks. Now in this mask, although they, I mean, there is no hole for exhalation, so it usually comes with blue. Blue doesn't always, you can some, you sometimes have non-vented, so these are non-vented masks. There are no... Uh, holes, but uh, sometimes you get uh, um, non-vented mask with the white shoulder, but but basically you, if you see a blue one, just make sure that you should not apply it under the single limb circuit unless you have some other way of exhalation. You can apply it, but if you, you must provide something, some kind of exhalation port or maybe in the single limb somewhere, maybe some kind of a port in between this one and to the uh, um, corrugated tube in single tube so that you can exhale through the port. So you must provide an option for exhalation if you put one of these unmented masks into single limb. Otherwise, you should not use that one. Okay. Um, so I, I hope I made it clear about the vented and unvented mask. But sometimes, uh, so these are some of the uh, just clear the whole thing. So some of the holes in uh, zoomed one. So this is actually a, another set of, uh, so this is actually a non-vented mask and you have connected the filter and uh, here somebody has done some oxygen entrainment. So there are advantages of doing that and disadvantages. So we'll talk about it later. So and you can see in the, in the purple one, there is a vent over here. So the patient can exhale. It's a small hole, but that hole is enough. You get some amount of leaks through the mask, I mean around the mask, not through the mask, around the mask, and then through this uh, exhalation port. And you should not cover that port, thinking that this is leaking from this port. There's a design in the single limb circuit for the patient to exhale. So I hope you get that point uh, clear. Single limb circuits, always make sure that you have an exhalation port. Dual limb usually is connected to the ventilator. Ventilator has good exhalation port all the time. So it's okay to use a non-vented mask with a dual limb circuit, vented mask with a single limb circuit, or some kind of exhalation option when you connect. So this is a uh, uh, close-up view of some of these exhalation. These are called exhalation ports. These are this can be purchased uh, separately. Um, from the manufacturers if you don't have um, because these vented masks are usually designed in domestic kenda because you don't usually use vented mask in the icu because it it just you know sprays all the infective material around the when, when you try to care for the patient if you have a vented mask uh, then all the respiratory you know droplets everything will be sprayed onto your face when you get close to the patient so generally speaking we should not be using um, vented mask, but they are designed for domestic environment so that patient can sleep comfortably, so that can exhale, inhale, and have still use the single limb cell. But uh, if because we have only non vented mask, if somebody wants to use this mask on a, to give CPAP, they must make sure they have an exhalation port. Maybe they can use the, the blue shouldered one with one of these ports. Okay. Way there should be some kind of so we have to make sure that some, some way of exhalation is possible with the mask. Okay, single limb ones, as I told you, is less bulky. 
and uh, they have to have some way of exhalation port. And then the page caregiver is exposed to patient exhale gas directly. Uh, but dual limb is bulkier, but they exhale, exhale through the exhalation port of the ventilator where you can place a filter. Here also you can place a filter uh, if you have a port, not mask. Mask, of course, if you have holes in the mask, there's no point putting HME into that part because you're going to leak everything around. So some people have seen uh, they use HME filters. Um, when you have a vented mask, no point. Okay. One confusing thing is this valve. So there is a thing called anti-asphyxia valve. So it's usually located, there is a big hole in the shoulder of this mask. And people think this is a vented mask. So this is not a vented mask. This hole is not designed for the patient's exhalation. So this is actually designed. So for example, if somebody is sleeping with a mask. So this actually, this is a vented mask. You can see holes over here. The patient can breathe through that one. Suppose, so you, you've been uh, connected to the gas supply from the ventilator and so say may maybe some power failure or something, and then the gas flow stops. Now the patient is connected to the mask, the patient is sleeping, and there's no gas coming because the ventilator has stopped working. In that case, patient should get some kind of gases, like, you know, usual this is design. Like when, when you insert this one into the, uh, so in the normal position, when there is no gas flowing, the flap, this flap, flap A, will be in this position. But once you get inspiratory gases coming in, when the ventilator is functioning, this thing actually flows because it's lightweight. It just opens. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so it, it just opens uh, into this one so that you get, get air, patient can get air. So once the airflow stops, it comes back to the uh, position so that this thing opens. So this vented, so this, this, I'll tell you once again, if I confused you, um, I'll just erase these markings once again. So this is where the vent, uh, the anti-asphyxia valve, this is the valve. So usually when the air flows, it goes and closes this orifice. So you can't breathe from that one. Air enters or the oxygen enters from the source or the ventilator. So once the uh, ventilator or with the stops or the power failure, something happens. Now this flap, once again, from this position comes to neutral position. So this, this thing is open now. Now the patient can get room air entering so that they can breathe at least room air. So if they are getting oxygen, they are getting room air, yeah, but at least they get some kind of air, yeah, otherwise they will they'll be suffocated during their sleep, especially if they have high carbon dioxide, they might even die on the bed uh, if they are comatose or something like that. So, so this works only when the supply gas fails. This is not a vented circuit. You can have this one in a non-vented mask also. Yeah. So this hole, don't confuse with the vented non-vented mask. So I just told you this one because these masks are available nowadays after the uh, COVID period, now we have various kinds of masks, you know, um, around the, most of the places. So people do not know the differences between vented and unvented and this anti-asphyxia valve. So I thought um, to uh, give you some kind of idea. Any questions about that uh, mask? Anybody having any questions? Or any other question you can even to ask, you can ask. Okay, so in the absence of questions, I'll go to the next scenario. Uh, once again, um, this is just to uh, tell you, just knowing the ventilation, you know, ventilators and all these techniques, they, may, they might not help the patient. So unless you understand the rationale is and the principles behind application. So the guidelines keep changing every five years because the current line guideline is not the best. That is why it keeps changing because we always try to improve. So there is a scope, scope for improvement because we are not doing, still not doing the exactly what the patient is needed. That's why, I mean, we are improving. Guidelines are very important. 
but always if you use the basics and apply them with the guideline then you understand whatever we are doing so the idea of providing ventilation is to control the carbon dioxide uh, that's actually the ventilation and then provide oxygenation to give some oxygen but the oxygen is actually needed to the tissues Oxy there is no point having oxygen in the blood and if you are not delivering enough blood to the tissues so this is the 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 the, the message i want to tell with this uh, scenario there are some uh, yeah, okay uh, so so this is in this scenario um, <clears throat> okay this is a 65 year old lady he was a um, diabetic patient on oral hypoglycemic drugs and uh, she had fever, cough, from SOB, maybe some chest infection. And uh, she was saturated 90% uh, with the face mask oxygen, 10 liters. And then uh, the diagnosis of sepsis due to pneumonia. And somebody applied CPAP of 15 centimeter water to this patient. Now, this is a common thing, uh, application of uh, CPAP, even uh, to patients with infection. I think it's it's a good option, at least to buy some time until you decide whether to intubate, ventilate, or just kind of, you know, it's a good thing. Although the, the, the latest evidence says it's not going to be effective in infective patients. But, but basically, at that point, when you have a low saturation, so it's not an uncommon thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to apply CPAP. To improve oxygen so, so DPAP improves the mean airway pressure so there are few parameters important for oxygenation when you want to in improve oxygenation you first thing is you try to increase the FiO2 the amount of oxygen given second thing is try to add some PEEP and then at the same time improve the mean airway pressure so those are the three main parameters which is um, helpful in improving oxygenation FiO2 PEEP and mean air pressure. So PEEP actually increases mean air pressure, but you can do improve mean air pressure without increasing PEEP also. Mean air pressure is, but it's the mean pressure. If you take a minute and say you have a, a pressure control value of 20, um, I'll, I'll explain that one in a minute. Uh, I'll just uh, continue this scenario. Okay, so CPAP was applied 15 centimeter water, which I think is like little bit too much to begin with at, at the first setting generally i would apply a slower pressure and generally slowly increase because some people uh, when you apply a higher pressures there are certain uh, station uh, center they try to you know hit hard with the cpap and then improve oxygenation rather than you know waiting a lot long time to improve oxygenation but i think uh, it's best to go slow with the mask because the acceptance of the mask is very important if the patient does not accept the mask because it's high flow of you know gush of gas is going through their face they will not like it and they will most of the time reject and struggle with the mask anyway this patient was not struggling saturation improved 100 percent so everybody was happy saturation improved then we'll see what happened to the patient and then the urine output started dropping 5 ml, 5 ml. She was having fairly okay urine output. Now the urine output started dropping and became almost, you know, she became almost aneuric after the application of um, CPAP. Now, usually in this situation where the patient is worsening and you are thinking about the lung condition and then there is a tendency not to give fluid and anything because it's true that then one of the uh, arm in ARDS is when you have a refractory hypoxemia to limit the amount of fluid given so that we know that if you take the alveoli uh, and then if you have a layer of water in the alveoli so that you know that the, according to the fixed law of diffusion so we have a thicker membrane and then oxygen find it difficult to get into the blood vessel Carbon dioxide is okay because carbon dioxide is 20 to 22 times more soluble. So carbon dioxide can, you can have a normal or lower carbon dioxide, but you have a lower oxygen. So people try not to give fluid because they think in the leaky capillaries, the fluid can enter into the 
capillary and alveolar interface. So dropping the saturation even further, worsening oxygenation. So because of that problem, a lot of people try not to give fluid. This is not the correct thing in all the time because some of the patients are hypovolemic. For example, these people uh, who has been having some illness and coming from home illness for a few days, they are most of the time hypovolemic, even though they have a history of heart failure, because they are I, I can't expect anybody having fever of and you know to replenish all their volume. They are usually hypovolemic. But uh, because of this, um, you know, the latest evidence, they are good, they are scientifically proven, but only thing you have to apply them with. I mean, depending on the situation, rather than, you know, blindly believing everything. So this patient, uh, a dose of fusimide might given because they think, okay, the patient is having some issues with oxygenation and we're not going to drop in. I don't want to give fluid. I'm just going to give some fusimide. might. This was the, um, the decision taken at that time. And the urine output improved. So anybody having any issues? Any concerns? Are you happy? Everybody happy? You're not put to improve. This time also a silent crowd. It's okay. I'll just go ahead. Um, <laughs> so the blood pressure started dropping. Now this is, now you must have seen one of these cases because if you have worked in a hospital for a sufficient time, you must have seen these patients and the blood pressure started dropping. Still we haven't figured out what is happening. And then we uh, started, you know, some, or not we, I mean, this is actually one of the hospitals. So, so they started uh, a vasoconstrictor like noradrenaline because that is one of the first line thing we start in sepsis. Not too bad, you know, to improve the blood pressure. It's a good uh, attempt because then you have low urine output, blood pressure is low, so low. So noradrenaline is a good choice to get the mean artery pressure up that might improve the renal perfusion and might uh, uh, improve the patient. But once again, noradrenaline, if you know the pharmacology, it has got um, beta-1 effects and uh, no, it's no beta-2 effects. It has beta-1 one, one and alpha. So beta-2 is the one which dilates the vessels in the uh, skeletal muscles and, uh, and there it causes bronchodilatation also. That is why we use adrenaline, which has got beta 2, as the antidote for the anaphylaxis because um, uh, so it had, uh, adrenaline has got alpha effects for the vasoconstriction. Beta 2 actually, sorry, beta 2 actually uh, has got, be, adrenaline has got beta 2. It, it improves skeletal muscle blood flow. Also, once you give the IM adrenaline, so it just, it helps to, that's why we don't give IM or adrenaline, we give IVM adrenaline because it improves skeletal muscle blood flow at the same time, it has got this alpha effect. Anyway, so noradrenaline has got no beta 2 effects. So it it improves the mean artery pressure because in, with adrenaline, it drops the diastolic blood pressure because the skeletal muscle gets vasodilated. Noradrenaline does not cause that one. So it increases diastolic, increases MAP, increases Systole. So all parameters are improved. So noradrenaline is a good choice to improve blood pressure. But once again, blood pressure is something we measure in the arm with the blood pressure cuff, unless you have an arterial blood pressure monitoring. But still, that is the pressure in the arm or maybe the radial artery. So it doesn't really translate into the renal perfusion pressure or hepatic perfusion pressure or brain perfusion pressure or the perfusion. But we just take it as a surrogate. Okay, blood pressure is good. We assume that the kidney is getting perfused. We assume that the brain is getting perfused. But this is just a, I mean, when you go back to the basic, it's just the pressure at that point. It's simply that. So you just try to assume everything else. But if you have a hypovolemic patient, when you start noradrenaline, so this is uh, some, some certain study, this is disproved. I mean, they say it's not happening like that, but just imagine that if you have extreme hypovolemia and you haven't given enough volume, so noradrenaline will try to vasoconstrict most of the vascular beds. That might include the renal uh, bed also, but some, some people say this is not happening like that. But I have seen um, in extreme uh, hypovolemic patients, when you start noradrenaline and they, they go bad with the renal function. But once you have given some fluid, 
so that the vasoconstriction can happen in the skin and the splanchnic circulation, but they can spare the kidney because they have enough volume to get the pressure up so that the baroreceptors in the in the brain get stimulated and you know sympathetic is reduced so that they can sort out you know the blood pressure if you have some volume in the circulation. So in an average person, noradrenaline will not reduce the renal perfusion, but in extremely hypovolemic patients, they can have a detrimental effect on renal perfusion. So this patient we don't know because they came from the ward, sorry, uh, from, from the from home, and maybe she was hypovolemic. Next day, patient was on two inotrop on high doses, and the urine output worsened. Patient went into AKI, and she died with sepsis and multi organ failure. Now there are so many lessons we can learn from this uh, scenario. Now this is a very common, not very common. I mean, not uncommon. These things are happening because we just try to we have a knee-jerk response, and then we collect certain information from here and there. We read some study in a certain lecture. They say don't give fluid. They can get into the uh, you know alveolar capillary interface and it will worsen your gas reaction, which is true. I mean, they have found out in certain cases, especially in ARDS with CVA ARDS, you know, um, it can happen. And when, especially when you have a pneumonia, viral pneumonia, something like that, maybe COVID or some other viral pneumonia, they can damage the alveolar capillary membrane. And then there is high amount of leaking happening. In that case, whatever the fluid you give can get into the alveolar capillary interface, but not in each and every patient. And you can always try some crystalloid. If it is too much, then you can actually, you know, give some fusimide and get it out. But usually fusimide should not be the first thing. You can at least try, you know, assess the volume, you know. There are so many ways of assessing volume. You can use a capillary refill. You can use urine output. You can use ultrasound scanning. You can use various other methods. So it doesn't matter what method you use most of the time. If you combine most of the methods to get some idea about the volume status, it is extremely difficult, even today. I also find it difficult to assess the patient's volume. Whatever the, you can use the ultrasound scan, you might say, okay, the uh, IVC is not collapsing, then patient is, you know, when you have a noradrenaline, when you start noradrenaline, all the blood from the splanchnic and the skin can, you know, squeeze into the central circulation. You might see a non-collapsing IVC where you, the patient is actually not overly hydrated. Sometimes things can happen. Oh, in this, at the other hand, if the patient needs some spontaneous breathing and you try to breathe very, and rapidly, you know, some dyspneic patients, some kind of, you know, difficult in breathing, they might have some kind of fluctuation in the IVC because they are struggling to breathe. So these are not hard and fast things. I mean, that's because the IVC is not collapsible, doesn't mean so you can give some fluid bolus sensitive. There are so many things. That's a different, altogether different topic. Anyway, so, so the getting back to the basic is important. So the oxygen is actually needed at the tissue level. There's no point just looking at the, what is the problem? I mean, I saw that saturation was 100%. So how come a patient dies when saturation is 100%? So saturation is, if you have hemoglobin, let's say we have 100 molecules of hemoglobin per deciliter, something like that. So how much of this 100 is saturated with oxygen? Hemoglobin has got, you know, four binding sites. And usually when you get one oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, so it facilitates the binding of the next. It's called facilitative binding. And when one oxygen is bound, all four oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin. You can't have a hemoglobin with only one oxygen molecule bound. So if it is saturated, so if it is saturated, we'll say, okay, one. One out of 100, one is fully saturated. So you get hemoglobin molecules. And if you get all 100 saturated with all four sites, it's called 100%. But if you get only 50% saturated with oxygen, so if saturation is 50%. So these two hemoglobins, you don't have oxygen. So likewise, saturation. So, so that means your satur saturation only says you have whatever the hemoglobin. So your hemoglobin may be 5 gram per deciliter. Saturation only tells you this 5 gram is saturated 100%. It doesn't mean you have enough oxygen in the blood. It says the hemoglobin is saturated. Okay, let's see. I mean, this patient's hemoglobin is normal. We'll say hemoglobin is 12. Now, all 12 is saturated. So it means that if, they, if you look at the hemoglobin and saturation, both, you can get some idea about the content. 
So you have a certain content. So in a deciliter of blood, you have maybe some 15 to 20 milliliters of oxygen. That's the content. But how much oxygen is delivered to the tissue will depend on the content and the cardiac count. So if your cardiac output is the most important parameter in delivering oxygen, so ventilation, when you do ventilation, so this fact must be, you know, remembered all the time. This is one of the most common fact or truth, which is not considered in, uh, because we basically focus on oxygenation. O oxygenation is getting blood into the, getting oxygen into the bloodstream from the lung. So how the lung functions, that is the oxygenation. The arterial blood gas will tell you about the oxygenation not oxygen delivery. So it will give you arterial blood gas. If you look at the arterial blood gas, you can have say PO2 of, we'll say 250. And people might think, okay, this is very good. I mean, it's good oxygenation, right? So that tells you, depending on how much oxygen you are giving to the patient, what is the arterial one? So it tells you how the lung is function. So it's good in certain instances, like if you want to check the lung function, yeah, that's good. But it doesn't necessarily Translating to oxygen delivery, if your cardiac output, for example, if your cardiac output is 5 liters and you have a normal oxygen content, so you deliver usually 1000 ml of oxygen per minute in a healthy person, only 250 is being consumed. But if your cardiac output drops to 1 liter or 2 liter, or we say 2.5, you only provide 500 ml of oxygen to the tissue. For the tissues to um, basically, this is not a hard and fast figure, but usually you need about 600 ml of oxygen delivery per minute for somebody to survive. The reason is you consume 250, you can't simply provide 250 ml per minute because I mean, you can't extract all the oxygen from the blood. So, for somebody to live, you must deliver at least 600 ml of oxygen per minute. Now, how do you provide 600 ml? Because you have hemoglobin. You have saturation and you have cardiac count. So this is the only one when the lung is having issues with oxygenation. This is the only one which can acutely change. Now this patient having pneumonia, you cannot change the hemoglobin all of that unless you give blood. It has got its own complications. But this patient himself or cannot increase the hemoglobin. So saturation is the problem. They have a lung problem. And the cardiac output is the nature's way of controlling the oxygen delivery. Now, we forget that one because oxygen is required at the tissue level. That is where the oxygen is utilized. Oxygen has got only fun one function in the body, just to accept the electrons in the electron transport chain. In the, uh, what is this, uh, oxygen, uh, aerobic oxygen um, step cycle. So that is the only function. Anything extra is going to damage the cell. So the cell has got various mechanisms to protect itself, like your superoxide dismute, so many other enzyme mechanisms to protect itself. That is why nature is not having any enzyme secreting oxygen from the atmosphere into any state. So from the atmosphere down to the cell, it happens simple diffusion. There is no other, at least secondary, if it is oxygen so important in nature, there, there is no other at least facilitated diffusion, nothing, only diffusion, because excess oxygen is going to damage the cell. Now, how does the nature provide oxygen? By changing the cardiac output. Now, we forget that fact. We only, so the so oxygen comes to the lung and then into the blood. So this is the process that we call oxygenation. Oxygen delivery is getting this blood delivered into the tissue. That includes the cardiac count. So we simply forgot the concept of oxygen delivery. We only focused on oxygenation. One reason is all the guidelines concentrate on oxygenation. So if you look at changing PEEP, changing FIR, changing this thing, a PA to a fire ratio, nothing about oxygen delivery. So this is why we have to change the focus when we managing patients. Oxygen delivery, oxygen is needed in the tissues. So we must provide the tissues. So in these patients, when you have acidosis, if you give bicarbonate, now bicarbonate will shift the oxygen dissolution curve to the, you know that bicarbonate will shift to the right to the left. If you give bicarbonate, oxygen dissolution curve shift to the right, is it correct? Left. Left. So it shifts the curve to the left. So it, it 
we know usually in the oxidation curve so when you this is the po2 we'll say saturation or content something like that and then it will allow the po2 to drop to 22 this is a la 20 or 22 this is the minimum po2 the capillary should contain for a living cells if it drops less than 22 so this this part of the oxygen you cannot this is oxygen content this part of oxygen you, the cells cannot utilize so normally your oxygen content is about 20 milliliters per deciliter, something like that. So I'll just say some value. And then it is brought down to, you consume about 5 and 25% of this oxygen. So you have a reserve up to this level for the cells to, when there is a problem, they can extract. So once you give bicarbonate, so you cannot extract because this part now becomes unextractable. So by giving bicarbonate, so that is why it's very important. So you can give bicarbonate to save the heart if it is very severe acidosis. But these are important stuff which are not properly described in a proper order. So you might, you know, think it ah, the acidosis 7.23. I should correct this one to 7.4. If you give bicarbonate, this is what's happening. So you are having oxygen in the bloodstream, especially in this kind of patient, it's going to be pretty bad because the body is trying to release oxygen we should actually shift the curve to the right but we are actually body is trying to shift it to the right that is why body is having acidosis and using the acidosis to shift the curve to release more oxygen so that saturation whatever saturation we can the body tissues are trying to extract oxygen but when you give bicarbonate you completely oppose that process at the tissue level but you don't see it you see it in the blood gas ah Oxygen is perfect. Now the vixilla has improved because there is no utilization of oxygen in the tissue. Tissues cannot extract oxygen. And all your arterial blood gas, venous blood gas, they all improve. And you think patient is improved, but actually happening, the kidney is failing, the device, all of the organs are failing because they cannot extract oxygen. There's no point circulating oxygen in the blood vessels if you cannot extract. Anyway, so the idea in this, this particular um, scenario is to make sure that you deliver enough oxygen to the tissues. That is why sorry, we take oxygen. That is the only in, uh, use of oxygen is to be utilized at the mitochondria in the electron transport chain. No other reasons. So no point having oxygen in the uh, tissues. No point having oxygen in the mixed venous if the tissues cannot extract oxygen. So so in this instance, if we have, I don't, I don't say if we just you know, we could have saved this patient 100%, but but this is a common scenario happening in most of the hospitals. Where you apply CPAP when the urine output drops. First thing is to give some frosimide because do you think the lung... So it's okay. Sometimes it may be the indicated thing if you decide that the patient is hypervolemic and some other reason. But usually if you just apply CPAP, urine output drops, it generally indicates some kind of hypovolemia and reduction in venous return because of the positive pressure reduction in thoracic, you know, venous return, and then uh, reduction in cardiac output. So cardiac output, so once you give frosimide, and there is no way, I usually use the urine output to look at uh, the effect of cardiovascular effect of peak. So I don't usually give frosimide. I basically, um, unless my uh, advice, I don't allow my MOS to give frosimide to patients because I use that as a parameter, the capillary refill, refill and uh, um, the urine output as a guide because I don't have cardiac output monitoring in my ICUs when I, I work hospitals I used to work. Okay, so we would have saved the patient if we focused on oxygen delivery other than the oxygenation. We would have been much better uh, keeping saturation maybe 95, 92 or your 93 and having a lower peep initially so that the patient maintains urine output and the Cardiac output. I hope you get some idea. Anybody having any question, you can ask. Uh, so once again, this is uh, oxygenation does not necessarily ensure adequate oxygen delivery. Cardiac output is the most important parameter. Because that is the only one which the body can change in an acute situation when you're having a problem with oxygen, like saturation. So that is the only thing. The hemoglobin takes, you know, weeks to, you know, you improve, you increase the, whatever the hormones and stuff needed for production of erythropoietin and everything. So it takes some time and it won't happen 
um, quickly. So cardiac output is the most important one. Make sure the cardiac output is maintained when you do any intervention with the ventilator. Okay, so this, so any questions with that uh, patient? Anybody having any question? If you want, you can just add some in the chat. If you find, you know, feel like you don't want to ask questions verbally, you can add these things in the chat. Anyway. Okay. So once again, uh, so you must have learned some theory about the ventilation and I have given you enough time, I mean, enough opportunities to ask any questions about the ventilators. I'm just going to tell you certain stuff. I'm just trying to make some impact on, you know, outcome, patient outcome. So I'm going to show you certain common stuff um, and uh, application of the normal uh, ventilator principles in one of these uh, situations. So this, uh, these are not exam-oriented questions. You may not even see them uh, in the exam questions. So, so I told you last time uh, about this pressure waveform. This is the pressure waveform, the, the yellow one. You can see the pressure going up. There's the inspiration, and then with the expiration, the pressure usually has to come back to um, peak value or baseline value because you just open the exhalation valve, pressure should come down to whatever the exhalation. So this actually there is some kind of slow wave, but that's okay. And then all of a sudden it goes up once again. Uh, so you have two inspiration very close together. So we'll see the video. So you can see there are two inspirations happening, one after the other. Usually patients don't breathe like that, you know. <laughs> I don't. I mean, usually they have a regular kind of breathing pattern unless they have some kind of brain injury, something like that. So these things, these are usually problems with the, uh, how we set up the ventilator, not the problem with the ventilator because the way we have set up. Now this is called double triggering. This is very common, but because we don't know about this one, so you don't actually recognize it on uh, ventilators, that's a common. Double triggering, how come double triggering happens? Now, I told you last time, we set the inspiratory time on the ventilator without knowing how much time the patient's brain, you know, neural respiratory time, we don't have any idea, but we set it because we want to set the IE ratios to one, once again, I'm talking about IE ratio. Uh, so if you set it like that, maybe we set it to a certain value. Or you, without that one, you set certain inspiratory time. But the patient takes a longer inspiration. Now what happens if if the patient, now the now this is the patient. So with patient, we'll say patient inspiratory time is patient, what this is what the patient wants to take the inspiration. But the ventilator say, has designed to give. So we have set the ventilator to give the inspiratory time above this size. The patient inspiratory time is much lower. Now patient tries to breathe and the ventilator gives a breath. And then because the ventilator time is, we'll say 0.8 seconds or something like that. And after 0.8 seconds, it opens the valve so that the patient has to exhale so the gas comes out. But the patient is still trying to breathe. The gas comes out because the valve opens but the patient is still trying to breathe. So uh, after this one, the ventilator once again thinks, okay, patient is still breathing. So it gives another breath. So that's, that is because we have not uh, correct. I mean, the inspiratory time, what we have said is too short. When your inspiratory time is too short, you can get what we call double triggering. And the patient will not like this the second breath because the patient is trying to you know, finish that breath, but the ventilator trigger another breath, and it's depending on whatever the inspired time. So you can have a lot of inter interactions with the ventilator because the inspired time we have set, set is not correct. Anybody who did not understand that one, I can explain once again. Okay, I hope you understood what I said. So, so the, the treatment in this instance, you can the, we can do some ventilator management which may or may not work 
but the treatment is to figure out why the usually this happens is acidosis some kind of you know patient tries to breathe deeper and harder so you can so you can correct the ventilator in spirit time but you should figure out why the patient is doing that and then probably treat that one if the patient is acidotic maybe treating acidosis will correct the double triggering but in the meantime you can correct the inspirit tract but it, this is not the final if unless you have set a very short inspirit time this is not the treatment i'm just showing you how you how i settle this problem but this is not the treatment but you have to correct the problem but this is like you know increasing the fio to sorry like increasing fio to uh, when the saturation drops that is only a temporary measure so i'll show you what i did in the you can see the inspire time is 0.5 so i'm going to change it to um, um just going to reduce the volume so i'm going to change it to a value higher so that you can see it instantly fix the problem now there is no double trigger but this is not the final treatment i just showed you some of the things but this can be attempted maybe it will fix but most of the time there is something else going on so maybe if the patient is trying to take deeper breaths maybe it's acidosis something like that it's best to correct the underlying problem i'm just showing you but uh, in this patient because they are struggling there's no point trying to and then the patient even further because they struggle these are some of the uh, thing we are just uh, show you time to time the importance of setting the inspirit time or correcting that one changing that one to the patient's requirement you may have to change it maybe one or two times a day maybe once a week i mean depending on how the patient behaving usually um, at least once a day depending on what the patient is trying to do you can change the inspirit time that should be a part and parcel of the icu ventilator care uh, if the patient is changing its physiology or pathology you should keep changing the inspirit time to suit the patient's needs so then you can minimize the given because the patient if the patient struggles then you they they may not be comfortable then you will have to give more sedation but if they are okay with breathing then you can minimize sedation you know improve their cardiovascular function because they are breathing well otherwise you will have to paralyze this patient so these are it can be prevented by understanding some of these basic principles of ventilator um this of course um, i don't expect you to understand what this waveform looks like completely uh, but i'll try to show you um, some principles of trying to analyze one of these uh, so so i'm going to show you um, this is actually one of the ventilator in sri lanka i think this i took from hambantur somewhere so this uh, ventilator has got a, this green one uh the, this top one is the actually uh, inspiration so this is the flow so you know that flow is a vector variable so during inspiration it goes above the baseline exhalation below the baseline so um so we'll focus on to the first breath forget about all the other complex breaths so you can see pressure goes up to a certain level with the breathing and you get some flow into the lung so this part says above the baseline flow going to the patient so this is inspiration so this part says flow away from patient this is exhalation so it, here by if you look at this part says okay, above the waveform so this part is inspiration below the baseline uh, so that is exhalation above inspiration below exhalation things like that okay we'll go back to the first one um uh so so pressure has risen to a certain we said 21 and then uh, pressure goes above that value at the end of the inspiration if you look at this one the so exhalation is not complete so before the exhalation finish there is another breath has happened and this goes way above the so if you look at this one now this is another breath inspiration has finished over here the inspiration is finished but the ventil valve has not opened the patient tries to exhale that's why the pressure is going up 
So if you see any breath and the pressure, usually pressure control value, if you set pressure of 20 or something, it will stay at that length. But it should not go up because ventilator is not providing this pressure. So patient is trying to exhale, but the expiratory valve is closed. So that is why. So forget about all these things. These are actually because this ventilator is failing to uh, match the patient's flow timing. That is why all this uh, this particular ventilator is very bad on a spontaneous breathing patient because it fails to uh, you know quickly provide what the patient is expecting. So these are very common in this particular ventilator. If the patient is breathing spontaneously, but all these post-operative patient, non-critical patient, they are okay. But anybody who is in critical ill should not be on this ventilator. Anyway, so this this will focus on this particular breath. So you can see the breath inspiratory flow away from has finished over here. So inspiration is complete, but the patient cannot exhale because the valve is closed. The time, the inspirate time, what we have said is too low. Patient patient has about this much of inspirated time, this much inspirated time, this much inspirated time. But we have said a low mandatory breath. These are spontaneous breaths anyway. So, so, so here, if you see very high peaking at the end of the inspiration, pressure waveform, at the end, if you have a very high peaking, one of the reasons is too low inspiration. The patient is trying to exhale, but the valve is closed. The patient forces her exhalation and the pressure goes up. So in this instance, you can say, so this patient was struggling and the nurse was asking whether we can give more sedation. I said, so actually I changed this patient from this ventilator to another one. But if it is a normally working ventilator, I would reduce the inspirate time to match the patient so that patient can exhale from here so that it should settle. But this particular one, I changed the ventilator because this ventilator is not working. Okay. Um, I hope, uh, so don't expect to you know and understand the entire, there are so many other stuff you can learn actually. If you want to, let's have, if you look at this waveform and the exhalation, all of a sudden it's going upward. So anything going upward, it should, Patient is trying to breathe in. So here actually patient is trying to breathe in. And you can see the pressure is actually, but the ventilator fails to recognize some missed breath. It fails to recognize that one, but those are complex ones. But there are so many stuff uh, to learn from this picture, but I just want you to remember that if you see a pressure waveform at the end, if it's going up, peaking, one of the common thing is, uh, too, short, too long in spirit time. There are other reasons like, you know, valve blockage, things like that, uh, expiratory valve malfunction. But one of the reasons is um, too long in spirit time. Uh, I don't know what, what I tried to tell you this this uh, graph. Um, can't remember. Any... <clears throat> um, okay, so we'll see this um, scenario. And I hope you know about uh, time constants. Time constant, um, I'm not going to go through in detail because it's a difficult concept. So it's a mathematical concept, time constant. Uh, so when you look at an exponential curve, exponential function, so they say if, if something is happening at this rate, so how long does it get the time it takes to finish or reach the zero baseline? It's called one time constant. And then it's mathematical. So you, you need to have at least three time constants for this function to finish. So that's a mathematical one. I'm not going to go into, go into details, but the ventilator, when you take the lung, emptying of the lung, so the time constant equals resistance into compliance. So if you have anybody having a, so this is expected time constant. This is actually available in this particular ventilator or most of the ventilators, even the say other ventilators we use, Hamilton, so you can actually See the expected time constant. People don't pay attention to that one. But um, anyway, time constant. So if you have a patient with asthma or something, their resist resistance is high and their compliance is maybe normal or slightly elevated. But when the resistance is high, you need more time. So three time constant, you need more time for the exhalation. If their compliance is low, for example, in ARDS, you need less time so they can breathe faster. 
so their lungs feel faster doesn't mean they feel a lot but whatever happens the process finishes faster the time constant time constant so each and every alveoli has got different time constant but uh, i'm just going to show you in this particular one uh, with a patient with low time constants uh, so you can see the exhalation waveform is actually quite low inspiratory one we haven't completed if you allow maybe it is long too but uh, we have set a shorter inspired time patient is i think this patient was paralyzed or something um so i just uh, clear the inks and pay particular attention to these waveforms uh and then you if you go to numerics uh you can see the time constant is 1.16 that means you need at least 3. Point, i don't know 5 or something seconds to complete the exhalation so if you reduce that part so asthmatic patient if you have this one 3. Point something so if you increase the respiratory rate to 20 or something then you don't have enough time for the exhalation so you invariably you will get air trapping if you increase the respiratory rate in this particular patient so respiratory rate so because the payment so this patient is getting low mid i don't know what ventilation patient was getting so this is actually 3.37 i don't know whether you can see uh, 3.37 3.37 minute ventilation is a low one so if we increase the rate that's not a good idea so we'll see what we can do instead so you can see uh, respiratory rate is 12 I don't the I don't have the re resistance value over here. Usually in a ventilated patient, it should be five to ten. But if you have a high resistance, then it will show up over here. But here actually you can see there is some kind of high resistance. Uh, that is why the time constant is high. Okay, and it keeps changing with each and every breath, depending on how they calculate, but usually it's something close to one, at least three seconds is needed. So I'm going to increase the inspiratory time because inspiration is also not finished. Tidal volume is only 258, 275 something. So we'll see if we increase the inspiratory time. So I'm going to increase from 0 0.8 to, I don't know, I can't remember which one I increased. So here in this instance, 1.6. And we'll see what happened to the tidal volume now because the inspiration can go a little bit longer. So we'll see the next one. See, 400 something. I didn't change the respiratory rate, but it, it must have reduced the expiratory time, but still without. So, so if you keep on going, this minute ventilation will keep on rising because just after setting, it will not completely you know, come back to six or something, but it will improve. So by changing the inspiratory time, this patient is definitely paralyzed that there was no attempt to add anything at all. So, um, so, so this is, you can actually increase a little bit more, but you should not increase too low so that you don't have enough time for exhalation. Once again, this is one other instance I want you to um, recognize. So not the IE ratio, just look at the inspiratory inspiration. You can cut it short. It's okay to cut it short. Um, if it is so, I mean, especially in COPD patient, we cut it off. We, we should not allow the patient to breathe long inspiration because they find it difficult to take it out and push it out of the lung. So, but it should not be too prolonged. But this instance, I could increase the inspire time without changing any other parameter to get the minute ventilation I want or the tidal volume I want. She was getting only 200 something. That will not be enough to clear the carbon dioxide and things like that. Uh, uh, but in this case, I could uh, manage without uh, changing much, just the inspired time. So make sure that you pay more attention to the inspired time. Okay, uh, hope I, you understood that uh, technique, you know, paying more attention to inspired time, not the IE ratio. Once again, um, because uh, I have given you enough opportunity to ask your academic questions, I'm telling you some of the stuff uh, so that you will save more patients. I'm going to select one other uh, scenario where 
we could have been preventing this. Uh, so I don't want to, I have a lot of success stories, but I'm showing you some failures, not my failures. I actually uh, taken from the same hospital I'm working. Uh, this was another uh, 29 year old girl. This happened on Sunday. I was not in the hospital, but anyway, even if that was not my fault, but I would have, uh, if they asked me, I would have, you know, give, given some kind of advice in this patient. Uh, so whenever you see this kind of patient next time, make sure you, you can save the, all these people easily by um, knowing the principles. So this is 29 year old girl, once again, near drowning, presented to ED. She was okay, dyspneic, low saturation, but still living. GCS is okay. She's very dyspneic at rest. So saturation was 68 on room air. That means she has had some kind of, you know, water in the lung and having some problem with the diffusion or the oxygenation in the lung. So, so saturation improved to 85% with oxygen and 97 with the CPAP mask. Blood gas improved. Carbon dioxide is now normal. But the patient continues to struggle and complain of difficulty in breathing. Now, this is common, especially with the drowning patients I have seen. I've seen so many drowning patients. So even if you give just increases oxygen, but they still struggle to breathe. Anybody having any idea why this is happening? So this is actually application of uh, the usual. So are you happy that CPAP having a normal carbon dioxide? So there is a usual kind of, you know, saying that if your carbon dioxide is normal, apply CPAP. If your carbon dioxide is high, apply BiPAP. That's not too bad, but it's not always. So you just, that is actually following a protocol. You don't know why we do that. You just think, okay, carbon dioxide control. That is what we want. But you have to also look, look at the patient. If the patient is struggling and complaining, complaining of difficulty in breathing, anybody, any guesses? At least say something just to, you know, make it more interactive. It's okay to have a wrong answer, but just. Okay. Hysteris, absence of hysteresis. Yeah. I couldn't hear. Lung compliance affected. Lung compliance affected. Excellent. That is the answer. So I wouldn't expect, I thought you would say some kind of pneumothorax, but lung compliance is the problem. Because, I mean, we focus on oxygenation. The patient, they say saturation of uh, 85, patient will not die. But, um, you know, but that's, there's a problem. 85 is, is a problem. And improving with CPAP 97 is very good. But only thing CPAP will you know, help her work of breathing because when you have water in the alveoli, so when you alveoli, uh, he actually went into a respiratory arrest later. So when you have water in the alveoli, the alveoli becomes quite stiff and then you find it difficult to breathe. Now, CPAP will help to push this water out of the alveoli and most of the time CPAP will, is the only thing we need it, and then they will uh, the water will be pushed out of the alveoli and lung has got an enormous supply of lymphatics. The lymphatics is clear the water out from the uh, alveolar capillary in, in the interface, interstitial space. But if you have a lot of water and the patient is at the verge of going into respiratory failure, they still, they don't have enough capacity to breathe. They are difficult in breathing because they have been struggling. Like if I ask you to run at a speed of, we'll say some, um, five kilometers and or something like that. Um, you will run at a certain speed for a certain. We'll say you run about three kilometers and then you get exhausted. But if I run, ask you to run at twenty kilometers per hour, you will probably run hundred meters or two hundred meters and then you will collapse because you can't do that because the lung has got the same thing. Lung is designed in a low, high compliance. Uh, and a very efficient way so that you can breathe from the moment you are born to this world until you take the last breath, you are breathing. And you don't even know that even during sleep, you breathe. But if you have any kind of, you know, increase in resistance or reduction in compliance, then stiff lungs, then it's like, you know, running faster. That this patient is like, you know, 
running 20 kilometers an hour, but she cannot continue that. So closer to that point, when you apply CPAP, she should improve, but sometimes it's, there's not enough time. She, ha she, ha she can you know, regain the muscle power and she's still struggling with the compliance. So in that case, don't think about this carbon dioxide. So you won't have a problem of low carbon dioxide, you know, washing of carbon dioxide, having a hypocarbia causing death. So you can apply a BiPAP in this instance so that patient can get a decent tidal volume. CPAP will continuously you know, help in inhalation, but exhalation is once again difficult because exhalation, you need some kind of, so if you give BiPAP, then patient gets support for the inhalation and the pressure drops and it's easy to exhale. So it's much better, especially in exhausted patient where they need some work of breathing. So carb, BiPAP, CPAP, you can use it. That, that formula is not too bad. You know, high carbon dioxide you need because you are ventilation is affected. You need more ventilation. That is, you can apply BiPAP. But if the carbon dioxide normal, maybe CPAP is good. Maybe if the patient is still struggling, patient has got a work of breathing issue, then it's best, better to at least initially apply some BiPAP. Don't try to be, you know, strictly following this, uh, the things like, you know, high carbon dioxide, BiPAP, low carbon dioxide, CPAP. So they are usually okay, but you have to look at the patient. And uh, so these young ones, they don't have, you know, all of a sudden they don't have any other problem. They are not, you know, they haven't taken any, um, I mean, I don't know, this girl, uh, she hadn't taken an overdose or anything. This is just water causing oxygenation and compliance problems. You only corrected the oxygenation problem. Compliance problem will need some time to sort out with the CPAP. But in the meantime, you would have sub provided some BiPAP and some ventilation for the patient. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of other scenarios. I think it's we have some of the other eight minutes. I'm just going to finish in eight minutes. So this is another scenario. Um, I don't know what I try to show you this one. I'll just see. Okay, this is um, not a very common thing, but it's very important finding. This was a patient uh, who came in 2020 or something. Um, hanging patient uh, transferred from Monoragala. Um, so this patient was pretty bad, saturating some 60 or something. Uh, I mean, very uh, bad lung ARDS uh, with the aspiration pneumonia ARDS. So anyway, within six days, he was completely suitable for extubation. So he was improving. This is uh, six days after six day or six or seven. So we were uh, planning to extubate him. He was oxygenating well. So all of a sudden, this thing happened. He started struggling. Now, once again, uh, I'm going to quickly go through um, how we... So we try to see where the inspiration is. You can't see, maybe just tiny bit something over here. But it should happen. We expect maybe this one. So here, I don't know. Still, I can't see this. Maybe exhalation because it's going out. But you can't see any breathing. So there's no gas going in and out. Tidal volume is 25. But this happened all of a sudden. Otherwise, he has been fairly okay with the lower pressures. We are fairly... Um, so they have increased respiratory rate in this instance. Uh, because patient was not getting any breath, but this is a catastrophic thing which happens rarely. But people usually change the ventilator. You must have changed the ventilator in patient when the patient is not getting ventilated. Uh, so that's probably the best thing to do. Rather, if, uh, but I'm just was just curious to see. Uh, so we just started the hand ventilating, and I took some photos and tried to analyze, and I realized something wrong with the valve of the um, so because you can see there is no exhalation happening. I'll just show you another picture. Now, if you look at this one, now this is the inspiratory kind of thing, but it should be compatible with the upgoing pressure, but it's actually happening like, like that. And the expiratory waveform is, I don't know, some bizarre waveform. So this is because when the expiratory valve, you have a filter and the expiration, you have a valve. If the valve is sticky and it is not opening, then the patient cannot exhale. So during the patient tries to exhale and pressure goes up to very high value. And when he stops, he gets some gases from the ventilator. So this is actually, the, it should be in exhalation, but he's getting some gases during exhalation. 
and he tries to push that air back and there is no and then because of the higher pressures gas starts leaking around the sticky expiratory valve this is a very complex one but just to remember these things are happening but we, we keep changing the ventilator and just to correct so this instance i didn't change the ventilator because i knew what is happening so look at the time at uh, 11th of uh, this thing eight o'clock and then we we started hand ventilating this is where the uh, this is actually the flow sensor of the new port ventilator. You have a uh, valve over here. So this is the valve. We washed the valve because the valve was sticky and wasn't working properly. We washed clean and dried the valve and then put it back. You can see it's nicely working, the same ventilator, 10 minutes later. Have a good in so uh, we actually extubated this patient because the patient was okay and uh, it wasn't the, it was ventilator's fault. And we extubated and he was okay. He he actually went home. He was okay. We that was the plan of a planned day of extubation. But just because the ventilator was malfunctioning, we should not postpone. So he was okay. I mean lungs are okay, all the parameters are all right, it's conscious rational. So we we extubated and sent him to the ward. So this is one of the reasons. So when you look at if you actually take take it a habit, you know, you take some photographs. If you have any problems, somebody can take some photograph of the waveforms and then Use it as a learning experience to figure out. You just have to figure out, okay, where is the inspiration, expiration, and then think of other stuff. Um, okay, so those are, uh, I selected these scenarios, not for your um, academic purpose, but because uh, this is actually purely uh, for the outcome benefit of patients, because these things are not uh, very common in the book. So I just thought of, Explaining there are so many other stuff to explain, but I uh, don't have enough time. But um, so, if you have any other questions or academic questions, if you want to ask, you can ask. Uh, anybody you can even type it in your chat box so that I can. So, if uh, somebody asks, uh, three time constant equal expiry times when we have to set this set I time. Okay, so that's a good question. So, somebody is asking. I time. So, expiratory time is so the time constant the ventilator displays is usually the expiratory time constant. So, so they say, I'll just use uh, um, new, I'll use the <clears throat> whiteboard. Can you see my whiteboard? But I'm Yes, sir. Uh, it's not writing properly. <laughs> oh, my battery and my pen stopped working. Okay. Um. So okay, I'll just try to explain. Uh, because I don't know. They can write. Oh, I can write with the king. Now, time constant is usually expiratory time constant. So they take. The compliance and resistance, they measure the compliance resistance during exhalation using this uh, flow waveforms, things like that, or other methods. So you get expiratory time constant. So you cannot, inspiration, you have a different time constant. Expiration, you have a different time constant. So by looking at the time constant, you only can set the expiratory time, not the inspiratory time. Inspiratory time should be, you You look at the waveform of the pressure, if the pressure waveform is, you give a pressure control, Ventilation, SIMV pressure control. We say SIMV pressure control. I have set 1.5 second in spirit time. But you look at the flow waveform. Flow is like that. Uh, so the, you can see you don't need 1.5 because you can, oh, sorry, not like this. It's wrong, I'm sorry. Um, how do you clear that one? Undo. Okay, so um, so the flow is like this. So the inspiration in this instance is less than one point five. How much? There are two ways. One thing, if you if your ventilator has got a freeze function and you freeze the screen, and if you have a cursor, you can say in the new port you have a cursor, you can get that closer to this one. It shows time. Maybe this is actually two point one from the beginning. And uh, you get the cursor to this point, and maybe it is two point 
uh, five. That means four in four seconds. Means a very short one, but for an example, so that you can get the time, or you can keep reducing inspired time until the expiratory part comes closer to the inspiratory. Like you know, like you get a uh, wave something like this, just after inspiration, you exit. So that that is how you set the inspired time. It's okay to have a waveform like this if the patient is paralyzed, sedated, and you want to have more inspired time for some other reason. Because if you have more inspired time, your mean ARV pressure rises, and that will increase the oxygen. This is the fact. This is the, the theory. Some people know. So okay, mean ARV pressure. So I can just have an inverse ratio. So that when you have inverse ratio, so your inspiration is too low compared to expiration. And you most of the time your pressure is up at uh, up level, so you get the uh, increased mean RV pressure. May, uh, this is actually not one is to two. May, this is actually maybe three is to one, something like that. So so your mean RV pressure rises, but you have so many other complications like you know expiration not finishing and having auto peep, uh, pneumothorax, cardiovascular compromise. There are so many other problems. But this is not the first thing you should do when you have a problem of oxygenation but it is true you can increase oxygenation so in certain instances like you know if you think the the lung is you know heterogeneously affected and you have different different time constraints although the inspiration is finished maybe i can recruit some more alveoli by having a longer inspiration that is okay but it is not okay if the patient is struggling the patient is conscious rational trying to breathe and then we are setting a lower inspired time, that is, sorry, higher inspired time, that is where the problem is. If the patient is comfortable, it's okay to have that high inspired time. But if the patient is struggling, by simply changing the inspired time to this level, the patient breathes in and he, he can exhale. There is no struggling to exhale. So that you, there's no need to increase your sedation. So that you can reduce the sedation to a very minimal level by helping the patient to breathe the way the patient wants. So that is critically important in reducing sedation, improving, you know, the reducing the length of stay, things like that. The patient will be quickly weaned from the ventilator because there is no need to increase sedation. If you increase sedation, he won't be woken up for a weaning tomorrow because we have given too much sedation because the patient is not happy to be on the ventilator because the, the ventilator experience value is not opening at the correct time. Or you can use other modes like by level modes, there are levels, my of course, by level modes. There, of course, you allow the ventilator does not keep the valve closed all the time. It is like another CPAP level where the if the patient wants to exhale, he can still exhale while the pressure is at 20. The, the thing is, there is no completely closed valve. Pressure is 20, that is true, but they can exhale against 20 with some difficulty, not a lot, can still exhale with this high pressure. It's called bi-level. These are quite confusing. And the names are quite confusing. They say biphasic, bi-level, uh, so many other different modes. But you can see if the pressure is, if you keep the pressure high for a longer time, but the patient is still exhaling, that is a bi-level. So, for example, in the Newport, if you, there is a thing called exhalation valve. If you go to the menus over down, there's a thing called exhalation valve. This is usually off in most of the ventilators. If you keep it on, then it becomes a biphasic mode. Then the ventilator allows. So you have to always keep it on. I don't know what reason they are keeping it off. But if you keep it on, then the patient can exhale even during this period. So the pressure will not go up because the ventilator patient is allowed to exhale. Pressure is kept at 20. So they are exhaling at a higher pressure. So if you prolong that one, it becomes like an APR because you breathe at a higher pressure, and then you allow some exhalation, you breathe at a higher pressure. So APR is the same, APR is a prolonged inspired time in a biphasic mode, because they, they allow the patient to breathe on top of the higher pressure, but they, they use different, um, they use different um, nomenclature. It's the same thing, biphasic, if you have a biphasic mode, you get the pressure up, you will let the patient breathe in and out, spontaneous breathing. And then all of a sudden, after about five seconds, six seconds, you just momentarily reduce the pressure. So you get some kind of breath, not a complete one. So exhalation will not be complete. And you breathe and you let go. So this is 
you basically you have higher airway pressure airway pressure and you release APRV airway pressure is so you airway pressure is usually made in high level so that your mean airway pressure is high your oxygenation is high I told you there are three parameters FiO2 PEEP PEEP will have recruit some of the alveoli and improve um, VQ mismatch at the same time mean airway pressure this is one thing is you know I reverse I ratio or APRV but I'll never do reverse I ratio I have so many other ways of improving APRV I do in a different one but I'm not going to teach you my method because it's completely out of the regular teaching so I don't want you to confuse but basically APRV they try to keep the pressure high enough closer to 30 or some 25 30 so that they you recruit it's called open lung approach like keep the lung open all the alveoli are open and you don't have atelectatic alveoli when you use APRV I don't know uh, some people say it's good I have used it I use it in a totally different way but I'm going to teach you that one because it's um, way different from the textbook anyway uh, so uh, inspired time is a different concept expired time concern is a different concept you can get some idea about the RV resistance by looking at the time constant if it is anything above one or above that is a you know some kind of bronchospasm some happening all right any other questions or oh, there's one other questions in the list uh, so cough leak test is still valid before extubation yeah so cough leak test so extubation um so i usually don't do the cough leak test uh, unless the patient is being vented for some time but in the icu it's a good idea to do a cough leak because um Especially struggling patients, you must do it. Anybody who has been ventilated for even a couple of days, but if they have been struggling on the ventilator, so you get some kind of edema uh, around the cuff. So it's a good thing always in any patient. Although I don't do it, I don't, I'm not proud of not doing it, but it, it's, it's a must, I mean, in especially struggling patients, then you can see, but it, it will say that the airway, there's not much airway edema. So it's a good thing. Cuff leg test, you should do. Maybe each and every patient. That's a good idea. Any other question? Anybody? Um, you can just type in a question. I'll just be here for one minute. Or oh, anything what I said, uh, if you have any queries. Okay. All right, so let's wind up. Um, yeah, somebody else typed something. Let's see. Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any, any questions, you can ask, you know, convey the message. I'll just, uh, I usually help people by, you know, uh, using WhatsApp, uh, Viber. Um, so when you have a, a problem, a problem, I, I usually tell them, uh, I mean, give some advice. Uh, when the patient is having severe metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation and carbon dioxide, out, what would be the best option to reduce work or breathe? The patient having severe metabolic acidosis. So, the, so here is a good question there. Severe metabolic acidosis, some respiratory compensation, CO2 wash out. Uh, so the best work of breathing actually the co correction of metabolic acidosis. Now, when you correct the metabolic acidosis, it should be targeted if it is hypovolemia, correcting volume, uh, if it is, you know, um, some heart failure correcting the cardiac function. That is the ideal management, but you can give some bicarbonate, but not to completely correct, but you must remember every time you bicarbonate, it's going to diminish the oxygen release, but especially the myocardial function is directly affected by acids. So if it is very low as pH, then of course you can give a bicarbonate to get the heart functioning, but it's actually targeted towards the underlying cause, not the ventilator, you know, uh, work of breathing, you can, you know, increase the patient breathing spontaneously. You can, uh, you know, give more support and, uh, you know, various other things that are triggering slope supports. There are so many ways of, you know, matching the patient's pattern and maybe connecting to a faster ventilator. Sometimes that helps some of the slower ventilator, like, you know, the one I showed you that can kill the patient by, you know, not providing timely breaths. Uh, there are so many things you can do, but you should be targeting the acidosis, not actually doing many things with the ventilator. Okay.
See you then. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. On behalf of Jeffna Medical Association, I would like to thank Dr. Chandana for yeah. his uh, very detailed and informative lectures and for the um, very, uh, it would, I, I, I think that I'm sure that uh, participants would have benefited more. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, yeah. And uh, the recordings will be, will be shared in the WhatsApp group. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Chandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.